ago, we, we went through a, a whole series of models. Just, there's a bunch of stuff out there. We tried to come up with something that was visual that showed the journey of a disciple. Um, and this is, this is our shot. Um, but a couple cautionary notes. You know, first of all, the temptation here is to look at this and start putting people into uh, slots and pegs. It's a, it's a diagnostic tool. Uh, when we were, when we first um, unveiled this uh, last year, we noticed that people grabbed it and the first thing they were doing was like, oh, where am I? I gotta find myself over here. And then they started like, oh, I know, oh, this is where so-and-so is. And, uh, and it, it, can be, it can be kind of interesting and it can be insightful, but we, we want to caution you that this is, this is a tool. It's a diagnostic tool. We're not putting people in boxes, but it's helping us see the journey of a disciple from encounter through growing as a disciple and ultimately, hopefully, into being sent on mission. In calling and witnessing to others. Um, Father, Father Prentice, when we were, you know, kind of unpacking some of the things that happened last year when we unveiled this tool, he, he said, he gave the, the example of going to, into the doctor's office, and, you know, when you go in the doctor's office, the nurse comes in and she takes takes all this stuff, you get all the diet, all the stuff, you know, weight, temperature, all that. He walks, he breezes in, he looks at your chart, he doesn't ask you anything, he just says, uh, here's, here's a prescription, go get it filled. Wait a minute, you're treating a symptom. There's, there's, these can help. There's some things here that will lead to, that will tell you what the symptoms are, but there's more questions to ask. And, you know, I don't want to just be, I don't want my symptom treated. I want to talk about the root cause of what's going on. And I'll, we'll give you some examples of that. So um, <coughs> we wanted to say there's probably some better words that can be that can be used here. As you, you know, as you go through it, some people have sent emails saying, well, this would be better than that. And, and totally agree. There could be better terminology than encounter, grow, witness. But this is the language of the archdiocese, the archbishop has chosen. And in order to affect culture, we all have to be speaking the same language. So we we, uh, we, toy, we tinkered around with maybe changing, and then we decided it's more important to be consistent with the language that the archbishop has chosen and is trying to inculcate into the archdiocese. But we did break up the growth piece into two areas. So let's just you wanna you wanna talk about this? Yeah, so just a, yeah, so just a, a couple things. Um, this would this wouldn't be something that you would show your disciple. Uh, right. Right? <laughs> because oh I think you're here in cell five. Let me start under lordship and take you over to like disciple maker so you're here. So we don't want to box people in. And not everything is black and white. So when you think about how a child grows to maturity, what our child is doing at two might not be what our neighbor's child is doing at two. So this is really broad brush. And to Dick and Steve's point, the navigators have created a tool like this. Um, Focus has created a tool like this. Navigators, in a particular way, takes their characteristics straight from scripture. What we've tried to do is to build on that and talk about, practically speaking, in a Catholic framework, what might help your disciple, like what might their life look like if they are moving from, and as we talked about, you, you talked about how we kind of broke out the grow piece. Because after that initial conversion, even just secondary and third and fourth encounters, you move from a beginning disciple to a growing disciple to a commissioned disciple to a disciple maker to a spiritual influencer, someone that can, a disciple that can make disciple makers. And so under that heading of disciple, there's no way we could have possibly captured 
what those phases look like. Same thing with Sherry Waddell's thresholds. She gives us five thresholds, but within that, it's all going to look different. So this isn't like, hey, here you go. Here's what you need to do next, because what happens is that's a ditch. Then you can walk into like performance. Oh, as a disciple at this point, I should be doing X, Y, and Z. And what we need to remember is that the Holy Spirit and the grace of God is at work in these disciples' lives. So those would just be a few caveats. Yeah, there's some descriptors under each area. With typically, where's a person that has just had an encounter with Jesus Christ? What's kind of some big rocks that are going out of your life just to help you? You know, the other thing that to key in on here, I think that's really important is that this is not linear. This is not linear. It, it's te you know, we put it in this chart, and it's tempted. You're tempted to look at it as oh, I go from step A to step B to step C, but as you know, in your walk with Christ, you encounter him, you grow as a disciple, he, he helps you touch other people. But then you come back and you encounter him again in a deeper way. And, and Pope Francis has been explicit in this. You know, the encounter is, is not a one-time event, and we as Catholics know that, right? It's not a one and done, it's not a one-time event. We, we encounter Jesus, he meets us, and he takes us deeper all the time. So while it's laid out, and it'd be tempting to kind of look at it in a linear perspective, it's not. It's it's a circular thing. It happens over and over, and it kind of, you know, it goes, and you're going deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, God is not, you know, as, as God is not bound by the sacraments, it is his normative way of of working with us and pouring out his grace on us, he is not bound by the sacraments. He can work out, he's not bound by this box that Deacon Steve and Father Prentice and Mary Guilfoyle came up with either. You know, a person I've seen people have a profound encounter with Jesus Christ, and I mean, we read about it, Paul. And he was on the road already. It wasn't a, a he didn't check, check off a bunch of boxes before he went out to proclaim the gospel. He went from encounter to mission. He went from encounter to, wit to, to mission and witness. Um, but this will be a tool to help you listen and ask good questions to help your disciple go deeper. All right? Another, another point. So we know what that X axis is. It's encounter for a witness. Mm -hmm. The Y axis, we've kind of identified eight areas that when they're integrated into a life, it creates somewhat of a profile of a disciple. Other models might have 32 areas. So we bundled some of those areas, for instance, the first, the first, so so our guideposts or those eight areas that we've identified are lordship, the Holy Spirit, prayer, sacred scripture, community or the communal life, uh, servant heart, and virtues. So there's certainly more, but we try to we try to narrow <coughs> narrow those guideposts. So do we want to walk through maybe yeah. one of these. Let's do the let's uh, do let's do the definitions across the top Great. first. Um, so we we kind of try to capture what a person who <coughs> just encountered Jesus in a profound way what uh, what that looks like in a disciple and a person that's growing in holiness. So right across the top, it's uh, we're defining each of those. So let's do let's do that first. Yeah. So encounter, we defined it this way. So this is the stage where one meets Jesus and says yes to his invitation to grow the friendship. This is someone who has encountered Jesus and should be able to share his story with someone else. So this is a new convert. Right? This is the initial conversion. Under disciple, we defined it as the stage where one surrenders to the formative influence of Jesus on his life. And then at the end of that spectrum, where you have a mature disciple, you would, you, we would define it, but this is um, where one cultivates an insatiable desire to become all of God has created has an unwavering commitment to the world, has an unquenchable 
real concern for others. So here is someone who is other focused, whose mission, whose mission is a discipler, a disciple maker, and a spiritual reproducer. And then in the last area there, we define witness as uh, this stage is where the disciple is willing to make room in his life for others so that they might accompany them <coughs> as a friend or guide on the journey to discipleship. Though this is laid out in, in linear fashion, the mission permeates everything you do, right? I think we talked about it at the very beginning of, of Life to Life. In other words, mission is presented at every stage in a disciple's life as they come to Christ. And they see, so in this stage, this, this disciple sees all of life as missionary territory. So this has become a lifestyle for that person. Does that make sense? And we're going to invite you guys to talk at table two. We're going to flush this out and talk about, and we, want, and we want to invite you to speak into some of this as well. Absolutely. So, one of the, so an example from the difference between disciple and holiness is, um, you know, I decide that I need to, I need to get in shape go to the gym and I hate it, you know, it's like I'm sore, uh, but, I'm, but I'm in a discipline of trying to get in shape, but after a while, and I'm not there yet, just, just to be clear, but I have, I have done this, I, I, it, and then, but after a while, I want to go to the gym, it's, it feels good when I go, and there's something wrong when I don't go, at first it's discipline, pain, it hurts, but there's a, it, at some point, you can launch into, I really like this. I've heard runners have this when they have a, a long, long distance runners have a breakthrough. I've, ne I've never experienced that, obviously. But <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> anyway, and that, that's like one example. So what we want to do is just take a couple of these guideposts or benchmarks, better term, uh, and, and just go through them just so you can kind of see the flow. And then we're going to let you look at all of them and study this at, at, at a deeper level. Okay, so we're just going to look at, let's look at uh, Lordship. Huh? Yeah. And I also thought it would be helpful to define what Lordship is. Do we understand what Lordship means? I think the easiest image for me when I think about Lordship, have I dethroned everything in my life? Every idol, every attachment, in every area of my life. In other words, is God sitting on his throne in my life? And so Deacon Steve said he's never experienced the runner's high and getting past that, past that um, runner's high or getting past that wall. I still have idols. I still have attachments. I desire the Lord to be the Lord of my life. I am not quite there yet. So the question to ask is, who is sitting on the throne uh, in your life? And for me, lordship, if we tie it to scripture, is what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Or in 2 Corinthians 5.17, any man, uh, therefore I'm a new creation, the old man has passed away, right? We are, we are made new. So in my mind, that's what lordship means. And so under lordship, in the encounter, what does lordship look like in that, in that new convert to Jesus Christ? So lordship starts to have some influence when someone has come on Alpha and has had that encounter. They've tasted the Lord. They recognize that the hunger and the thirst, that emptiness that we were praying with earlier today, that he just might be the one who's going to fill my heart. They might get a taste of lordship when they've heard the charisma proclaimed in a compelling and magnetic way. Um, they might experience this as they're going through the RCIA process, right? So, so again, it, 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 they've heard the Lord, they find him attractive, and they're starting to make room in their life uh, for a change. Um, so a disciple would say someone who embraced, embraces Jesus as Lord. So lordship in the life of um, a disciple is the progressive handing over of one's life to Christ in all its aspects. And then these are the areas of lordship. Time, money, possessions, career, family, health, talent. 
every aspect of our lives that we're willing to take our hands off the controls of our life and give that to the Lord. They're no longer living for themselves, but they're living for their family in the domestic church. As a disciple moves into deeper holiness, where they're conforming their life to the Lord's character, they know who they are. They would define themselves as a son or a daughter of the Lord. What we see here is a progressive transformation of life by love. So loving God and loving people. So they have a heart for God. They're willing to make any sacrifice and personally grow. And they have a heart for people. So if possible, secures a spiritual director to assist in discerning the movements of their life. And then explores perhaps the lives of the saints. So they're hungry for models of holiness. And so, and then Lordship under witness uh, recommends, re this person might recommend resources to others to grow Lordship by encouraging someone to attend. So I'm reading some of this stuff right now and I'm not sure I agree with all of it. I mean, that's just kind of a disclaimer here. As we've been able to sit with this, I'm not quite sure all of this fits. So I'm, I'm just being very authentic here. Mm -hmm. As you sit with this and you study with this and you pray with this, I might have filled this cell in a little bit differently. But so, recommends resources to others to grow in lordship by encouraging someone to attend called and gifted. This person has a working knowledge of the church teaching. Um, here's how I would define it. This is someone who has a relationship with another disciple and knows how to speak lordship in a particular way in their life. So in my mind, this looks a lot more practical than sending them to a workshop. Where are you struggling right now in your life? Where can I help you? How can I integrate um, the lordship of Jesus in your marriage right now? Maybe you're struggling with work. In, in, in my mind, that's what this looks like. And, and Father P and Deacon Steve might disagree with me, but I think this is ultimately transformative. This is a disciple. Uh, I just think this becomes a lot more practical than sending some to a workshop. I think that might happen earlier. I don't know if that makes great. sense. Yeah, it's great. And uh, if something strikes you in your table discussion, make some notes and please get them back. Uh, we're pretty we're, we're pretty committed to staying with the big rock language to kind of real witness. Mm -hmm. but, uh, beyond that, some of these definitions of what it might look like are, are pretty much up for grabs. And we've changed this many times already. So, um, you want to take another? Yeah. Um, let's let's do let's do sacramental life. I mean, Catholics. So this is going to be. I, you know, I think. Where, the, where a disciple is in the practice of their, in the living out of their sacramental life, uh, says a lot. So let's look at that one. So I think it's on the last page. So across the top, encounter, grow, witness. You know, there's, in the sacramental life under encounter, that person will probably start to come to Sunday Mass, right? Um, begins to observe the Lord's Day. Under encounter. As they move into the grow phase as a disciple, they don't just come to Sunday Mass, but they start to honor the Lord's Day uh, and avail himself, herself, to the uh, sacrament of life of the church. It sets the Lord's Day apart for worship, family, fellowship. It's more than checking a box. It's This is a holy day. And... Uh, what I do and the decisions I make about this day that I set aside for the Lord and Prayer. Advent, Lent, they, start, they might start to come to Mass more than once a week. Um, under holiness, they strive towards sanctification by way of the sacraments. They're going to avail themselves. You, uh, you will see in this growth phase between this disciple and holiness, like... Um, you know, if I had a, something major, a mortal sin, something that I would get to confession, a person that's striving in holiness is going to use the sacrament of confession in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. It's just going to avail themselves to the sacrament of confession.
discussion um, more readily, probably. You know? um, rarely misses, they, they're going to come to daily mass more frequently, again, avail themselves of confession. Uh, and their whole life is confession. Um, under witness, uh, the sacramental graces, sacramental grace fuels the mission. Living marriage and family is mission. Living sacramentally is one's vocation. So, how I'm going to give we're going to give you some examples of how we use this. So, I was I was working with a, a a guy that I've known for like 25 years, and uh, good guy, good guy, not a Christian, um, but a good man. And you know he was looking for something. He he, he finally. He finally kind of fell into the um, CIA. He knew something was missing, and he, he decided to become Catholic. Uh, his wife died. I did, I did her funeral. Um, and, and a year later or so, he was uh, in our CIA. And Easter vigil was just very moving for him. But he owns his own business. And he's a, you know, he's really a mover and a shaker. He's getting a lot. I mean, he just, he's on the road all the time. And um, it's his Sundays were reserved for playing golf with his business uh, colleagues, uh, not colleagues, but customers. Right? It's about business. And so after RCIA, we met. We were just meeting for coffee and stuff. And this came up. But he was going to mass every week, and he would go on Wednesday. Because he, he wanted to go to Mass every week. But Sunday was, wasn't going to disrupt his standing tea time with really important clients for that. So we, we were talking. And uh, I mean, clearly, I mean, he's had an encounter. You know, but he wasn't going to Sunday Mass. So like, I didn't, I didn't say to him, you should be going to Sunday Mass. It's here in the box. You, know, you have an encounter, you should be going to Sunday Mass. What's going on? It was a diagnostic tool. What is going on here? I'll call him Saint. Um, and we talked about it. And it was like, God was asking him to trust his business and his clients. You know, that's, that's, that was the bigger, deeper thing. That was the root cause. That was the, the symptom was not going to some mass, but the root cause was lack of trust. So that's, does that make sense how you can yes. ask, you know, go deeper. Where is the, I think Father Prentice used it, you know, where's the no? Where's the person saying no to some of this stuff? And for you, as a disciple maker, that gives you a clue as to what their edges of growth might be. Where, where is the real potential? Where is God calling them to real potential and growth in Him? Um, I think that's the way He said it. Edges of growth. Where's the no? And that takes discernment. We're right. just going to talk about. This takes empathy. This takes prayer and knowing how to pose the question. Right, so back to Deacon Steve's original point, this is not a legalistic approach, right? Whole person. It's a whole person approach, right? When you go to the doctor, you want him to see you, look you in the eye, and just not look at the chart and your symptoms. A whole person approach, heart and body and soul. And, and you're not going to, these are how many guide tools? Do we, how many benchmarks do we have? So we, have, like, uh, we have eight, 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 eight benchmarks. It's a lot, you know? And through prayer and discernment, on your part, where's God, where's the biggest area of growth now? You know, eight is too many to work on, you know? Where's, where's God calling them to go deeper with him right now? Lordship's a huge deal. Lordship's always, I, that's always on the list. That's always, I don't know, that's always a challenge. Because even when I say, yes, you're on the throne, here's everything, tomorrow I'll get up and I'll try to kick him off again. I said, well, yeah, 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 but I'll take the check. Well, you got too much to worry about. Uh, you know, that's always, that's just always a battle. 
So that, so what we'd like you to do too, can, can you put up the, uh, the questions, the small group questions? And so you've got, you've got them at your table too, so we're gonna take what, uh, maybe about 20 minutes. to have some small group questions to talk about. The first one is, as you look at this benchmark chart, what observations can you make in light of your disciples' experience, in your experience working with disciples? Might be helpful too if we shared some real life experiences, real life examples um, of the benchmark as a diagnostic tool in your work with disciple making. Third question is, while profiles can be helpful as an assessment tool, we kind of already talked about this, what caution should be exercised when you're using any sort of a tool and why? And then what changes, if any, would you make to this tool to enhance its usefulness, to, to, to have it be more informative for you as disciple makers? So we'll do that for what, about 20 minutes, and then we'll just report out in the larger group. Is that what well, we're doing? Yeah, you got something? Is that good? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I would uh, maybe suggest an analogy which is a coach being coaching an athlete, coaching a team. And let's say you've got, uh, well, it could be anybody on the team, but for the, for the sake of discussion, one of your star athletes. And you don't hit them with everything at once, right? You watch their game, and you watch it over a period of time. And over time, you discern what will help improve this athlete's game most. And there's where the coach zeroes in and works with it. So what I would do with this, I might take it to prayer. So I, you know, I've been journeying with someone, and it's not exactly clear to me what's next or how to help them move forward most. And so I might take the, review this with prayer, asking the Holy Spirit, point out to me where my focus should be with this person. And maybe it's here, maybe it isn't. This isn't exhaustive. But maybe it's prompted by something that's here that helps me clarify where I should focus in kind of enhancing this person's, this disciple's relationship with Jesus, his response, her response to Christ. Because if we focus there, it's going to raise their game to a whole new level. So that's how I would think. I think of yourself as a coach, and then when you meet with your disciple, there's a certain, there's always a certain amount of teaching a coach does. It's teaching in the context of relationship. You know what I mean by that? Now, you don't get up and give a formal presentation like, like we're doing here. <laughs> but in the context, just think again of a coach working with his athlete or her athletes. There's a lot of teaching that happens in, in that context to help the athlete get a vision for what the next level should look like and how to get there. And that's what a disciple maker is doing. Then when you meet with a person, I've been praying for you. God's put something on my heart that I'd like to share. And, and then you uh, kind of unfold what, uh, what the Lord gave you. That's, that always helps. In the context of that analogy, the other thing the coach is doing is spending a lot of time, which goes back to I mean, prayer, absolutely. But you're, these things are not going to flush themselves out unless you're spending time talking about it with your with the person that is tight. Which goes back to the importance of relational ministry. Just spending time together is going to, and you know, calling on the Holy Spirit prayer is going to raise those things up to make them. A little more on this. So great, we got these discussion questions at the table. We're gonna do this. We're gonna go to Matthew 13.
verse 18. This is Jesus interpreting the parable of the sword. Hear then the parable of the sword. The seed sown on the path is the one who hears the word of the kingdom without understanding it. And the evil one comes and steals away what was sown in the heart. So every time there's a fresh work of the grace of God in life, God is acting, right? But the enemy's never idle when God is acting. So whenever there's a spiritual advance taking place in someone's journey, the enemy is lurking close by to see if there's a way to derail it, to thwart it. Mary was saying that every encounter has a shelf life. Billy Graham would say the same thing. Billy Graham, when he'd come into a city to do his crusades, he learned over time that he would not go into an area where there was no follow-up by the churches, organized and guaranteed. Because then he knew what would happen if that were missing, is that all kind of people would respond to the invitation. And then the lack of follow-up because an encounter has a shelf life would mean that it would not bear fruit in people's lives. What does that tell us? The work of grace, the sowing of the seed of the word is always vulnerable. And if it is not cared for by the one in whose heart the seed is sown, and if it's not cared for by the shepherds of the people of God, then the enemy is just poised to gobble up the seed, that work of grace that God has planted in the life. So we're alongsiders, right? Accompanying our friends and a, a lifelong journey of being the Lord's friend, the Lord's confidant, the Lord's disciple. And God will allow us for a period of time to accompany them in that spiral that Deacon uh, Steve and Mary were talking about of ever deepening encounter, growth, witness holiness and as that journey deepens the enemy as it says in first Peter is on the prowl like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour and sometimes what he does is but couldn't be more <coughs> obvious but sometimes it's subtle and we miss it, right? This is why I need someone who has an eye on my life in addition to my own two. It's why we all need someone. Someone said this earlier, that the disciple maker, the alongsider, can be so invested in helping others that his own journey with Christ gets neglected. And he's got to keep his own eyes on his own life. What does St. Paul said? Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. God forbid. But it can happen. Because that enemy is subtle and crafty in the way that he works. And so the question is, how do we help our people distinguish between 
the influences, the spiritual realities that are influencing them on their journey. The word for making those distinctions is called discernment. And so we want to talk about spiritual discernment, or you could say discernment of spirits, which we could, we could have spent every module on. Mm -hmm. So you're getting, you're getting a taste <laughs> that we hope that you'll follow up with on your own, uh, in your own study and reading. Because it really deserves much more than I'm gonna say uh, in this brief presentation. So we wanna be able to ask the Holy Spirit to help us sharpen our ability or grow in the grace he gives his people to distinguish between the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the evil spirit. Okay? So my hope is to talk about I, originally, it was to talk about three aspects of discernment. The first would be the movements. The second would be the weakness. And the third would be the voice. I'm pretty sure we're not going to get to the voice. Uh, and we don't, won't have the time before we take a break. But uh, if you want to raise it as a question in the discussion at the end of the day, I'd be happy to get up and talk a little bit about the voice uh, at that point. Okay? So let me share with you something from uh, the life of St. Ignatius, the confessions that he wrote. Augustine said this, he says, he, what he's doing is he's looking, he's converted now, he's looking back on his journey, on his life, that led to this life-changing encounter with the Lord. And here is, is his reflection. He said, you were within, he's speaking to God, I was without. You called, you shouted, you broke through my deafness. You flashed, you shone, you dispelled my blindness. So, I love this. He says, you were within, but I was where without. I was on the outside, in the external world. Now he's reflecting back on everything that led up to his conversion. And he's realizing that God was active within him, but all of his attention was directed outside of himself. He's absorbed in the external world and in his external, in a, in his external affairs. And in as a result, he's unaware of what's going on inside. So look at the way he describes what God, God is up to inside. He says, God is calling, shouting, seeking to break through my deafness. We can be deaf to what stirs interiorly. So absorbed in our external affairs that we're inattentive to what is happening inside of us. What's stirring inside, especially what's stirring spiritually. And why is this important? 
because God speaks through inner stirrings. But not just God. Mm -hmm. The enemy acts mm -hmm. through interior stirrings. And so, how do we overcome this deafness to the interior world happening inside every person's life? And so I'd say that dis discernment begins, now I, I, I should have said this, but this is all borrowed from St. Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuits, who articulated for the, his order and then for the church an understanding of discernment of spirits. And this was back in, what, 1500s? And here this is, has been so valuable to the church's life that uh, his rules of discernment or principles of discernment are being taught around. So discernment begins with cultivating or discovering the importance of spiritual awareness. Cultivating an, att an attentiveness to the interior. Meaning my thoughts, my feelings, my desires. The thoughts, the feelings, the desires that are stirring inside are what we call movements of the heart, movements of the soul. And what this awareness does is position us to understand if there, whether there's a meaning, particular meaning, to what's stirring and to distinguish between who might be prompting a stir. What are the options for who might be prompting? God and the enemy and yeah. So something simply arises from our human spirit, right? Thoughts, feelings, desires, they just arise from the human spirit. But God can move upon us in such a way that it provokes or prompts thoughts, feelings, desires. And so can the enemy. So we want to be aware so that uh, we can distinguish between the movements that take place within and discern the source behind it that's prompting. So Ignatius would say that uh, there are often contrasting interior movements. One he calls spiritual consolation and the other he calls spiritual desolation. So what does it look like, spiritual consolation? So this is a stirring that is uplifting, instills joy, gives peace, makes a person happy. That's what, it, that's what any consolation does inside. To say it's spiritual consolation means that the consolation directly affects or impacts our relationship with the Lord, our life of faith, and our pursuit of God's will. So, an example might be that someone in my family just passed away 
and I'm grieving it. I'm sad. <clears throat> Is the sadness, what's the source of the sadness? What spirit? Is moving. Remember, there are three options human spirit, human loss. And my response to that human loss is it makes me sad. And so I enter into a period of grieving the loss of someone I love. And then let's say the plot thickens. And while I'm grieving the loss of the one that I love, whose death occurred in an untimely manner. And then I notice my sadness intensifies and it says, God does not care about me if he took this person when he did. Now you hear something something further. Is that just the human spirit speaking? What do you think? I hear, I see a lot of people shaking their heads, no, and you're right. So there's a voice now that is interpreting the loss and interpreting the loss in a way that impacts this person's relationship with God. And this can happen in both consolation and in desolation. Consolation. It's my birthday. The people in the office made a, my favorite cake. And as the day ends after the birthday celebration, I'm just elated. I am just feel like I'm on top of the world because my, of the love, this outpouring of love and appreciation from my friends. It's a consolation, right? <clears throat> just human consolation, would you say? Or spiritual consolation? No, we're learning together. Don't be afraid. <laughs> just based on what I've said so far. Human. Just you. Human. Human. Yeah. Human. Yeah. yeah. Great time with That's my friends. Great yeah, time. And then, as I take this home, what I experience is I just burst out into thanksgiving for all that God has done for me over the years of my life. And I say, Lord, I'm at your service for whatever remains. And I'm just joy-filled. Now, what's that? Is that just human consolation? No. Spiritual consolation. It's now affecting my relationship with the Lord. It's expressing itself in the context of my relationship with the Lord. So, spiritual consolation, that stirring inside that is uplifting, instills joy, brings peace, makes us happy, and is always affecting our relationship with the Lord, leading us to Him. And that spiritual desolation is that interior disquiet, sadness. Sometimes people describe it as an affective heaviness. That subtly depresses. There's this thing weighing on us, you know? And we feel like we're in the mood. <laughs> it depletes our energy. Saps our joy. And it also directly impacts our life of faith. Our relationship with the Lord. Uh -huh. his so, some interior movements will lead us toward God, toward deepening our friendship with Him. These are from the Holy Spirit. Other interior movements will lead us away from God, away from friendship, away from obedience. And those are from you know who, the evil spirit. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question? Why don't you hold just a minute because we're almost done with this section. This is why 
spiritual awareness is so important. Because one of the ways the enemy sets us up is to lure us into leading unexamined lives. We're not paying any attention to what's stirring, except that on some level we know we're being nagged by bad news. And the people around us could tell us all about that, right? <laughs> we know we're off. But we're not responding to what's off. Or we're not reflecting on what's off. Why we're off. What's behind this sense of inner disquiet. So it's important to lead and examine life. Now, this doesn't mean navel gazing. Because it is the case that our gaze is supposed to be focused on God and others, right? Living a life of love. But then I go back to the comment that was made earlier. We love best when we're taking care of ourselves. And if I neglect a certain self-care, then I can get vulnerable to the enemy's work. And this is where examination, leading an examined life, is so important. So what Ignatius counsels is three things. He says, be aware, number one. That is, notice what's stirring inside. Second, understand what's stirring. Name it. Is this consolation or desolation? And what spirit is behind it? And third, take action. Accept or reject. Consolations we would accept, right? But the spirit that's at work in the desolation, we would reject. Spirit, it's spiritual desolation in particular. So it's important for us to see this for us, but it's important for us to help our disciples see this too. Because the enemy often from their perspective, he operates off the radar screen. It's flying just below the radar. And they miss it all the time. But an objective, prayerful, discerning eye can catch it and say, are you in desolation? Why do you say that? And then we explain why. They say, well, I never thought of that. And then we leave them in responding to what's going on inside. Okay. Question. Yeah. Uh, there was a, I see the dark night. Is that a, a positive desolation? So the question, everybody hear that? It's about the dark night as articulated by uh, St. John of the Cross in particular. So if we're dealing with spiritual desolation, who's behind it? The evil spirit is prompting that. And he's trying to lead us away from God, right? Now the dark night of the soul as, and, and of the spirit as uh, St. John of the Cross teaches it are a, a, a time of purification into which God leads us. So there's your first clue. Uh, God initiates this in order to do what? Yeah, to purify us is what the, uh, what the saints would say. And it begins with our active cooperation in the purification. 
And then it goes deeper into a purification that we can't quite get at. And God has to, they call it passive purification, meaning we receive the work of the Holy Spirit within us that's trying to get at things that are deep down there, woven into how our way of being that God's intending to release us from, free us from. That tells us that it's not a desolation because at least not a spiritual desolation because the evil spirit prompts spiritual desolation. But the dark night is a purifying work of the spirit of God. So these are two different things. Yeah. Is it safe to say or to help people that we're discipling? I'm thinking of an example where someone might say, oh, um, I feel like I'm really supposed to have this affair, you know, outside of marriage because it brings me so much joy, this other person. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Is it possible that the evil one can use the spirit of consolation in the life of someone to convince them? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, that an evil spirit can appear as a spirit of light in someone's life, and is it helpful to really point that out, do you think, concretely in some of this kind of discernment? So Ignatius' answer, in accord with scripture, you remember St. Paul is the one who coins the term that even the devil can masquerade as yeah. an angel of blood. Yeah. Uh, so his answer would be, yes, mm -hmm. that can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, in his experience, and the tradition uh, seems to agree with him on this, that for those who are, let's say, in the early phase of their journey mm -hmm. with the Lord, mm -hmm. that the, the, primary, the primary ways that the enemy opposes them is desolation, consolation. The, the enemy tries to undermine the consolation and lead them away to, from God through desolation. And then he says that for those who are more advanced in the spiritual life, that the enemy will use counterfeit des uh, consolation mm -hmm. in order to lead a soul astray mm -hmm. from what God really wants for them. Uh, so short answer is yes, there is a counterfeit version mm -hmm. of consolation that the enemy will use to lead people astray, and it takes careful discernment by a disciple maker, spiritual director, to distinguish between the two and what's going on in a particular case. Mm 